Okay, we're going to talk about the osteology of the pelvis and answer the questions, what bones comprise the pelvis, what are their primary bony landmarks, and what are some reasons to learn about them. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. So to begin, let's talk about the pelvis. Um, so let's begin with some terminology. The pelvic girdle are the two pelvic bones with the sacrum and pubic symphysis. So there's one and two pelvic bones articulating with the sacrum posteriorly and the symphys pubises anteriorly. Now that word pelvic bone, another word that is often used is os coxa. That's singular, one pelvic bone, but together the two of them are the os coxae. Some people talk about the innominant bone. I don't know if I've ever heard it except in literature. Um, and so pelvic bone and os coxa are the ones that we use. Now the os coxa is formed by the fusion of three bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Uh, there are some landmarks associated with the three fused bones together, and then we'll talk about the individual landmarks on each bone after. So to begin, there's a joint between the sacrum and the ilium. It's appropriately called the sacroiliac joint, which is a synovial plane joint. Very little movement, but these two bones are really knitted together through a lot of ligaments as shown in this anterior and posterior view from Gray's Anatomy that show how tightly this joint is put together. Next is this concave or this cavity. It's called the acetabulum, which in Latin means vinegar cup because evidently it looks like a vinegar cup. I don't use that term now. It's just like from the olden days. I don't know how old, but it's not like next time you're at a dinner party and you have your bread and you're like, I'm going to dip this in this acetabulum, you'll be the hit of the party. Yeah, people love nerds at parties. But the acetabulum is the socket where the head of the femur articulates inside of that in this ball and socket hip joint. Um, next, if we now take and rotate to the lateral view of this pelvis on the right side, there's that acetabulum again, and look at the three bones that articulate together inside that acetabulum of this adult, but look at this newborn. You still see this acetabulum with the three bones, but they're separated by this triradiate cartilage. Now, cartilage is not dense, so it does not show up on x-ray, so when you look at this normal pelvis of a four-year-old, it looks like a fracture, but no. That's just where the triradiate cartilage is. It's not a fracture. It's completely normal. Now, next is this opening. And whenever you see a hole, we know that word is foramen, and this is called the obturator foramen. That word obturator is Latin for to stop or block up. Because when we look at this obturator foramen, most of it is blocked up by this obturator membrane, this dense connective tissue revealing just tiny canal at the top called the obturator canal for the obturator nerve artery and vein to traverse between the pelvic cavity and medial thigh. Um, then we have this notch. It's called the greater sciatic notch. And the greater sciatic notch is uh, the area where the sciatic nerve goes from the pelvic cavity into the posterior thigh, as well as the piriformis. Um, and finally, we have this area right here, this line outlined in green. It is called the pelvic inlet. And the pelvic inlet, and we see it again from the superior view, is where the sacrum, the arcuate line, and the pubic symphysis are. This is an area the, of the, uh, the top of the pelvis where the digestive system, your genital system, arteries, veins, and nerves go between abdominal and pelvic cavity. Now, in an inferior view, there we also have this, uh, now it's called the pelvic outlet, which is where the uh, outlined by the pubic symphysis, the conjoint ramus, ischial tuberosity, and the coccyx, also is this now on the bottom of the pelvis, and it's a continuation between the perineum and the pelvic cavity. Now let's talk about the ilium. The ilium, um, and I'm just going to now move this over and then pivot, so now we see this medial view of the pelvis from the right side, there's our ilium. And there's a crest or ridge on top, and then there's a shallow depression. You think, well, what should we call this crest or ridge on the ilium? We'll call it the iliac crest. And there's that iliac crest. And what do we call this shallow depression? Well, we use that word fossa, so we'll call this the iliac fossa. Let's look at both of these in this illustration. There's our iliac crest on top for muscle attachment, and then there's the iliac fossa, which is the origin for our iliacus muscle going to that uh, lesser trochanter. Um, now, let's now pivot so we see a more anterior view, and now we pivot again so we see a lateral view of the pelvis on the right side. This is showing the anterior, and that's showing posterior, anterior and posterior part 
of the ilium. Now, I say that because there are four spines on the ilium, one, two, three, and four. So what do you call this spine on the front? Well, it's on the front and it's above, so we'll call it the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS, which makes this one the anterior inferior iliac spine. Well, what do we call this one? Posterior superior iliac spine and posterior inferior iliac spine. Um, in this view, the anterior view of the pelvis, there's the ASIS, and that's the attachment for the sartorius muscle and part of the tensor fascia lata. And then there's the anterior inferior iliac spine, as shown there, which is an attachment for the rectus femoris muscle. Now let's pivot so we look at the posterior view of the pelvis, and there's the posterior superior iliac spine. Now you don't really see it, but there is a dimple, that little dimple on the back. Next time you get out of the shower in all your glory, turn around and see your backside. You'll see that little dimple, and you see this that is sometimes called the dimple of Venus. That's where you can see where the posterior superior iliac spine is, and then there's the posterior inferior. All right, so now we have these gluteal lines that are shown, and there are three of them, the posterior, the anterior and the inferior gluteal lines. And they become important because those lines are used to describe the attachments for the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus minimus muscles. Um, and so there's the gluteus maximus, there's the gluteus medius, and there's the gluteus minimus muscles and their attachments based on those three gluteal lines. Okay, next we're gonna talk about the ischium. So, there is the ischium in green, and there is a spiky projection, there's a bump and swelling, and there's a branch. So what do we call them all? Well, what do we call this spiky projection? We'll call it the ischial spine. And what do we call this bump or swelling? The ischial tuberosity. And what do we call this branch? We use that word ramus. It's the ischial ramus. Let's go through these three. First, the ischial spine. And so that ischial spine above it is that greater sciatic notch, and below it is the lesser sciatic notch. And so when we do this and pivot from lateral to medial and move it, we're gonna see that ischial spine, and there's the greater and lesser sciatic notches. Now let's put the sacrum on there. If that's the ischial spine there, IS, and that's the sacrum, what do we call this ligament between them? Well, we call it the sacrospinous ligament, which then above it is the greater sciatic foramen. That notch now becomes a foramen. Now there's our ischial tuberosity, and there is another ligament. So what do we call that? It's the sacrotuberous ligament, and that's where the lesser sciatic foramen is now located. So there's our ischial spine. And now let's rotate to see the lateral view and we see the ischial tuberosity. Now the ischial tuberosity in this posterior view is right there, and it forms the attachment for your hamstring muscles, your biceps femoris, semi-tendinosa, semi-membranous muscles. Also, if you then see in this position where the ischial tuberosity is, is if your hips are flexed, it's what you're sitting on, sometimes people call it the sits bone, but when you extend, the gluteus maximus covers it. So when you're flexed, the gluteus maximus moves uh, away from it, but when you're extended in the hip, the gluteus maximus covers the ischial tuberosity. And now the ischial ramus. Um, yeah, ischial ramus. I'll talk more about that now with the pubis. So the pubic bone, so I'll take that away and we're gonna move this so there's a branch and there's another branch and there's a bump. So what do we call these? Well, that one that's a branch, we call it the pubic ramus, but it's above, so we call it the superior pubic ramus which is located there, the pectineal line. And then we have this bottom one, so we call it the inferior pubic ramus, and that's for muscle attachments with the medial thigh. And the inferior pubic uh, ramus articulates with the ischial ramus. So they're often called the ischial pubic ramus or the conjoint ramus uh, are the two terms that are often used for that. Um, and there you see it again. The purple one is the inferior uh, pubic ramus, and the uh, light green lime, if you will, is the ischial ramus. Kind of looks like pistachio. The pistachio one is the ischial ramus. All right, and then finally, this little bumper swelling, that's the pubic tubercle, and the pubic tubercle uh, forms an attachment with the inguinal ligament that goes all the way up to the anterior superior iliac spine. Um, and so there we have 
uh, between the two pubic bones, that pubic symphysis, which is that fibrocartilaginous wedge between the two pubic bones. And that, my friends, is the osteology of the pelvis in a nutshell.